Good morning. So in an era of climate change and increasing frequency of severe weather, which species will be successful, which unsuccessful, and why? These are some of the questions that we're trying to answer in my lab, and I'm going to present a case study that's being led by a graduate student, Lauren Schiebelhut, and is a collaboration with um, faculty at UC Santa Cruz, UC Davis, and also University of Georgia. In 2013, about 90% of Oka sea stars on the west coast of North America died. Um, they died from sea star wasting disease, and this causes the um, animals to dissolve, their skeletons to dissolve, their cells to dissolve, and for their limbs to fall off. This was an outbreak of pandemic proportions. From a few sites in, California, in Oregon and Washington, within nine months, it spread throughout the whole of the west coast of the U.S., and if any sites in which one cared to look at um, count numbers of sea stars, one could see a dramatic decrease in the number of individuals. Between 51% and 96% of, um, in, of sea stars died at each individual site. So there's a median of 90%. A variety of researchers have worked out that this is probably due to a combination of increasing sea surface temperatures. We've seen decreases in oak sea star numbers previously with association with the large Del Nino, La Nina of the, until the current on record. And we've also seen then this outbreak of sea star wasting disease, which has led to this um, mortality in the sea stars of a, over a geographic range of a severity and with a rapidity that has not been um, observed previously. But all of this is history. What we're interested in is the future. So what of the surviving 10%? It turns out that if one looks at the genetics of the adult sea stars, one can see differences between those that are diseased and those that are undiseased. And so, for example, here we have um, genotypes from undiseased individuals that have two different versions of a gene. Here, the diseased animals predominantly have just one version of that gene. So there are genetic differences in potentially in some of the survivors. We also see that there's a great um, increase in the number of recruits that are coming into the populations. So although we've seen the adult populations decimated, we see that there's an even greater increase in the number of young that are coming into populations now. So what does all this mean for the genetics of the future generations and the potential for this species to survive for long term? There are three things that we need to know. One is which sea stars survived the outbreak. Was it only those that are protected, or was it also some of those that um, are susceptible but manage to um, avoid being um, infected by, this, by the denser virus. Or, um, and, the also, and also the other is um, sorry, which individuals uh, managed to, when, when did the individuals manage to reproduce. And both of these things together will tell us which um, young larvae were produced and let out into the ocean and then which juveniles settle into the, into the um, rocky seashore subsequently. Are these protected individuals or are they susceptible individuals? And there is a third question which I'll get to in a moment, which is about this problem, the larvae in the ocean and the plankton and what happens to them. So there are essentially two extreme outcomes and then many varieties in between. And one is that the sea star wasting disease essentially killed all of the adults that were susceptible before they had a chance to reproduce. And that would mean that very rapidly would see populations that are only those with the genes that allow them to be protected from the disease. This would be a dramatic shift in the genetics of the population. At the other extreme, we might see that um, sea stars were able to reproduce before um, the disease outbreak um, swept through the population. And that possibly some of the susceptible individuals were able to avoid being infected. And in this case, we would see that um, there were many, many um, recruits they were both susceptible and resistant to the disease. And in this situation, we would see rapidly that we would end up with the same kind of genetic population that we had before the disease, and so a highly susceptible population again. And that's the work that we're currently undertaking in the lab in terms of doing some genomics of, of a variety of populations from bef samples from before and after the outbreak. The third thing we need to know is essentially what happens to the larvae. So if you look at this graph that compares the adults in a population with the recruits in a population, you can see that there's no link. And this means that um, recruits are coming in from elsewhere. From where, we don't know. Right? So these larvae go out into the ocean, they'll spend about three weeks in the ocean, and then they simply come back into the coast. And we don't know where they came from or where they're going to. I likened this to a problem with trains. 
One might sit at a station, see trains leave, but not know where they're going to. One might see then trains arrive and people disembark and have no idea where they came from. This would not be an acceptable situation in most functional um, systems. And as an engineering colleague once uh, recently said to me, the problem with ecologists is that we only bring problems. So what I would like to do is potentially like, link towards, um, not towards a, um, a solution. One of those solutions is, of course, carbon neutrality. So we, have, um, so we can stop climate change and we can have less severe um, weather. The other is to think about how we can work out what's happening to these plankton. And so I would liken this to um, a situation where we might have um, make use of all of the information that are gathered by a variety of train spotters, so it's simply looking at the trains that go through different places at different times and the directions in which they're heading. And if we were able to make a series of technologies, some kinds of drones, they're able to look at the plankton as they go past various places and to tie that into a network. And this would be a very simple, essentially, traffic problem we've seen earlier in the presentations today. One well, might be able to chart where the larvae are coming from and where they're going to. And this would be a technology that would be of great benefit. Mass mortality is becoming more common in um, ocean systems. And so in 2011, the harmful algal bloom essentially eradicated purple urchins from a 100-kilometer stretch of the coastline in Northern California. And again, we saw essentially all of the adults die, but we're seeing, again, very great potential for those populations to recover through recruitment. But this is not always going to be the case. This six-rate sea star was also affected by the um, sea star wasting disease. And we've seen, although we've seen not a, such a substantial decrease in the adult population, we've seen a decrease in the recruits. And so that's a, a system, that, um, a situation that cannot be um, perpetuated for long. Without recruits, the populations will die, the species will go extinct. So in an era of climate change with increasingly severe weather and um, potentially exacerbating disease outbreaks, there will be species that are successful and there will be species that are unsuccessful. And working out which and why is an important job for us. And part of that will be unveiling the enigma of the plankton. Thank you.